This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Shalom, everyone. What we're going to learn right now is how to live in the now. And when you learn how to live in the now, you're going to have an amazing surprise. So get ready also for a surprise. This class comes with a special surprise at the end. Okay, let's go. Shia, you ready? Okay, finish that mission. Let's go. Okay? You've got to be present for this. Here we go. Future, present, past. Future, present, past. Future hasn't happened yet. It's coming into the present, though. Present, happening. Past, gone. Future, it's like blank paper and a printer. Still hasn't been, you know, we don't know. He knows. We don't know what's going to be on that paper. It comes into the printer. Present is the inkjet hitting the paper. Past, the present goes out a shredder. Can you open the door all the way, please? Can you open it all the way, bring a chair or something? It's making too much noise. We're in a good part of the hall because there's no, uh, people don't mingle at the end of this hall. Past, so future, blank paper. Present, inkjet hitting the paper. Past, goes out a shredder, Right? Uh, show me a year ago. Show me a month ago. Show me a week ago. Show me a day ago. Show me an hour ago. Show me a minute ago. Show me a second ago. Gone. Show me a year from now. Show me an hour from now. Show me a minute from now. Show me a second from now. Not here yet. The only experience you've ever had in this world is now. Think about it. That's all you've ever had. The only moment you've ever experienced is now. Tell me, have you ever experienced time? You ever experienced time? Never. And isn't that interesting? You believe in something you've never experienced, which makes you kind of cuckoo. You're a little crazy because you believe in something that doesn't exist. Because why do you believe in something you've never experienced? Because the only thing you've ever experienced is now. And if I asked you a year ago and asked you what time it is, you'd say now. By the way, you can't even tell someone what time it really is accurately. Because by the time you tell them what, it's gone. The time they asked you is over. You can't even think about time. Sorry. You can't even think about now. Because if you think about it, where is it? (laughs) It's gone. You can't even think about now. Your brain is useless for thinking about now. The only thing you can do with now is experience it, which means I'm distinguishing thinking from experiencing because you have thoughts and you have awareness. Your awareness can ride the wave of now. You can ride the wave of now with your awareness. Let's all take a moment and ride the wave. Okay, well, what we'll do is, uh, everyone get your snappers ready? We're going to do a double snap on four, just meaning I'm going to say four, and we'll do two hand. We're just going to, I'll be one, two, three, like that. Ready? One, two, three. Ride the wave. Take a breath. And just feel the wave of now. Like if you've ever seen a recording studio, you know, you can see the music that was played. And then you see this line where the music's, you know, the musician's recording in. So it's like, it's like now is coming with a trail of the music that's been recorded. Ride it. Let's do it again. One, two, three. You'll start to feel something interesting. With your eyes open or closed, you will start to feel something kind of interesting, a bit of a buzz inside your body. That's not the surprise. That's just the bonus. But as you learn to ride the now, you get access to something. That'll be the surprise, the access you get. But we're already starting to access it right now. Now, it works like this. Future, blank paper. Present, it's coming in. And then the past, the shredder. The future and the past are conceptual. And they're important because you can learn from the past and you can plan for the future, and that's wonderful. Now, the sad part, 
And the reason why so many of us don't get to experience the now is because, listen carefully, is that everything that's ever gone wrong in our past to us, especially as kids, could happen to us in the future. So like, let's say I was embarrassed as a kid, I can be embarrassed in the future. If I felt rejected as a kid, well, I can be rejected now, in the f meaning in the future. We have a part of our brain whose job, it's called the default mode network. It's between the right lobe and the left lobe, right in the middle. It's called the default mode network. And that default mode network's job is to keep your brain quiet so you can stay on task with whatever's going on. So for example, if you're driving up the Palisades Parkway at no more than 65 miles per hour, you're driving up Palisades Parkway, so you think there's a view of the Hudson, you think there's trees, you think there's deer, you don't see any of them. Your passengers may, you don't. Because 90% of what you say, 90% of what you see, and it's been proven scientifically, 90% of what you see is a, what's called a predictive model. It's predictive models of everything you saw in the past. So you're driving in to the future, and 90% of what's going on around you, your brain is constructing from every other time you've driven. That's why, who would you prefer drives you to Muncie? A 16-year-old or a 35-year-old? And the answer is the 35-year-old, he's got more past to shoot into the future. So he's going to be really much more on task. 90% of what they, what they see is just predictive models the brain produces, because 10%, that remaining 10%, is on the bumpers of the cars in front of them. Because who wants to die? Who wants to get in a tr car wreck? So because we're afraid of that car wreck, we're on task, 10%. But everyone in the passenger seat, you know, I get to be a passenger a lot, and uh, because Hungarians, their language of love is, is uh, gifts and service, so there's actually... Three, um, there's three, I have three mobile services. I have Uber, Lyft, and WhatsApp status. Hey, everybody, anyone can give me a ride from Borough Park to Muncie? And then it's just a matter of time as the thing lights up. I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you. Because Hungarians love to do for you. It's their language of love. And so I'll be in the passenger seat. We're driving up to Muncie. I see like 15 deer on the side of the road. A couple of them have giant horns. And I always ask the driver, did you see those deer? And he always says, every single time, what deer? He thinks I'm his wife. What deer? <laughs> every single time. He, how, how can you not see 15 giant animals on the side of the road, some of them with huge horns? Because we simply don't see it. Now listen carefully. Your brain, that, that network that shuts down the networking of your brain so that you cannot crash, cannot distinguish 65 miles per hour down a highway and walking into a chasana. Because though, just like we're scared of being killed or maimed in a car crash, we're scared of rejection we're scared of failure. We're scared of being, being exposed as not in control. Meaning being exposed as weak, small, lost, victim, like not in control. We're scared of the unknown. The unknown, which is like, I mean, when's the last time you didn't have to deal with the unknown? How's never? And the last ones, we're scared of pain and suffering, which is how we drive carefully. So when I go into a chasana, I've got every time I've ever been embarrassed in my life at the chasana. I literally, like, do you know, do you know what, um, that rich people who walk their dogs, you've seen people probably walk their dogs in Brooklyn, they're carrying around a little bag. And I don't know how people do that. I mean, do people have no covet for themselves? You know, it's ridiculous. But rich people have a little more covet. You know what they have? 
they have this, um, they have a long stick with a little, like, you know, like a, like a dustpan at the bottom. And it's like, that's the wealthy person's clean up the, after the dog. It's called a, if you go on uh, Amazon, it's called a pooper scooper. And so, and so what you've been doing, listen carefully, what you have been doing your whole life is you've been taking, listen carefully, you've been taking your pooper scooper, because all that stuff that happened to us in the past, rejections, failures, being controlled by others, there are things that happened that surprised us out of the unknown, and other times we got hurt, you know, any boo-boo we got as a kid. We've been taking our pooper scooper, digging it into the past, and flinging it onto the future. And so what comes into the present is just the past in some new form. Why get out of bed when you can write the story yourself? Our lives have become so predictable. Because when you got your past wrapped up in your future, you can guess exactly how that wedding's going to go. You can guess exactly how everything's going to go. There are ways of getting the default mode network to be quiet. One of the ways that we get it to be quiet is, is, the, is the, work, the work I'm doing in The Possible You. That's one of the ways, is that you drill into, listen carefully, I'm, I'm giving away something that a lot of people I've never said this to. The way The Possible You works is we drill into the, and you might not understand them, but I'm going to say it. We drill into the content that the default mode network is protecting you from. And what happens is the default mode network has never had you look at that stuff directly. Because the way you, what you're vigilant for in the future, what you're protecting for in the future, is different what he is. And what you are is different what he is. So what we do the first two days is just identify what you've been protecting for. But it goes even deeper, is that the personality, our very personality that we've created, that we've been putting forward since we're kids, not since the beautiful toddler, meaning we took that beautiful toddler and went, that beautiful toddler was like a liability to us. Because when you turn three or four and you start looking around and like everybody's somebody except for you, so you start to cut and paste from your mama, from your tata, from the rebbe, from the this, from the teachers, from the, and you start you become somebody. When really that beautiful child was the happiest, most powerful, most expressed, most connected you ever were, and so we kick that little kid out, and then we become somebody. That somebody is how we interact with the future. as the future comes in. And all we do is our brain knocks out 90% of the people at the chasana so we can like find somebody that we know so we can feel safe to survive the chasana. So some poor fool's paying like $50,000 for this chasana and everyone at the chasana is just trying to survive. Everyone's just trying to get through it. I've met people who came to my seminar just because they were making a chasana. And they're like, I'm investing in this seminar time because I want to be at the chasana. Because people who do the seminar always are the people at the chasana, meaning when they make a chasana, they're always the people who have the most fun at the chasana. You're there. You're present. Now, when you put the past in the past, where it belongs. Where does the past belong? Everyone say in the past. Where does the past belong? In the past. Say in the past. Where does the past belong? In the past. When you put the past where it belongs, where does it belong? In the past. Guess what happens to the future? 
What happens to the future when the past is gone? Clean, clean clear. Clean, clear, empty. You have an empty future. You know what your problem's been all these years? Your problem's been that your future's been full. What's it been full of? <laughs> the past. And when you empty out the future of the past, now the future is empty. But there's something even more powerful, is that who am I going into the future? Who am I? Because if I'm not all the boo-boos I got, and I'm not the personality that I created to protect myself from the boo-boos I got, well, I think you can all ask this question. I think let's all ask it together on three. You ready? If I'm not really all the things that happened to me when I, you know, the rejections, the failures, the, that's not really who I am. And I'm not the personality I created to cover it up. So what's the question? Who am I? Who am I? What? You mean I got an empty future with a who am I for a me? Talk about fun. Talk about fun. I mean, you mean, you mean I just get to like, I, I grew up surfing. I get to act, surfing waves. I get to actually surf into the future. Like, the world's my playground? You mean Hashem now finally has me? How many times do people ask you to do something? Like a tata, a mama, a shver, a shviga, a brother or something? And you're like, oh man, that's, that's, that's going to be really hard. And then you call a friend, yeah, my sister, has me. you know, and I, it's, it's really, you know, I'm really stressed. Why? Because what you got to do is outside your job description of what you, how you see yourself. And so now it's a hassle, and you get exhausted. I mean, even in the things you do do, the things, the things you do, sorry to use the word do-do again, the things you do do, where does your energy come from? So if what you do is actually covering up who you, who you feel you are, which is not so positive, how exhausting is doing? How exhausting is it to do? So it's very exhausting. But when I'm, it, the, when I'm in the who am I mode, so what's the answer of who am I? And when I'm in that who am I mode, so then, well, let's answer. There's four steps, and I want you to hear this carefully, and for people who are graduates of the seminar, this will be new for you because I've just added this in the last year. When I no longer know who I am because I put the past in the past and now I'm just riding the wave. And let's ride it one more time. Let's snap on four. Ready? We're going to ride the wave into an empty future and I don't even know who I am because if some kid embarrassed me in school during, during Hafsaka, is that who I am? Is that who I am? No. You know, but the problem is none of us went home that night to our parents to say, guess who I found out I am? I'm a loser. You know, parents are like, you're not a loser. You just got embarrassed in front of the kids. But none of us said it. We all went home with these big eyes, sitting at the table, eating our soup, going like, oh my gosh, how will I survive the rest of my life? as a loser. And then within literally 24 hours, you already created who you're going to be. And all of that is a major departure from the beautiful child that Hashem made you to begin with. The beautiful child. It's all just one big divorce. It's a chatzitze. Meaning, meaning if this, there's a microphone, if this is the beautiful child. So believing negative things about yourself is clearly a chatzitza. Covering that up with a personality is a double chatzitza. And then what are you going to do? You're just going to do, because that's all the stuff you do to let everyone know you're so smart or so capable or so whatever. And so you do and you do and you do and you do. And at the end of most people's lives, they'll put on the matseva, Done. And there'll be a lot of people, they'll be sad, they'll cry, and grief is grief. But a lot of people will be like, 
Whew. Because of all the circus hoops that everyone has to jump through to get close to you. Because it's, it's heavy to be close to you. You make anyone who's close to you, you let them know real well how to, in, how to interact with you. You've made the rules real strong. You don't tell them it's a vibration. Don't mess with me. And so we're, we all interact with our loved ones with all these rules that are, bunch, that are garbage and exhausting. And that's why, ladies, you have that so much drama in your life. I have just, all I've done right now, it, you could call this class, is I've explained why there's so much drama in your life. Because everyone's walking around with this image of themselves bumping into everyone else's image. And it gets dramatic. There is no drama when you live based on the Shema. So we're going to snap on four. You ready? And we're going to ride the now. One, two, three. Now ride it. Can't think about it. If you think about it, you're not there already. Let's do it again on four. One, two, three. Feel it. I'll help you feel it. When you get really good at it, you can give it to others. One, again, one, two, three. Feel the energy right here in your forehead by the makom tefillin. Close your eyes a sec and look up at it. Ride it. Open your eyes. And do it again. One, two, three. Ride it. To an empty future with who am I? Here's the new material. There are four answers to who am I. Four answers. Each one of them is a nuclear power plant. Answer one, who am I? I'm my consciousness. I'm... I'm, which is my neshama. I'm my neshama. I'm a neshama. A chelik elokamimal. A piece of God. A shtik elokus. Well, that means certain things. Because once you're, once you're a neshama, that means that, A, God wanted you here, so I'm wanted. Everyone say, I'm wanted. Okay, make sure you cooperate. It's hard to say I'm wanted without your lips. Okay, you got to move your lips. Once again, I'm wanted. Um, he put you here for a purpose, so I'm important. I'm important. Um, he also gave you the ability to fulfill the purpose you were here, so I am uniquely capable. I'm uniquely capable. He also gave you the brains to pull it off. I'm uniquely brilliant. Okay? He also manages every last little detail of your life. Now, who would manage every detail of your life if not someone who loves you? Okay? So say the word, I'm loved. Okay? He's also given you like incredible creative power. Incredible creative power. I mean, if I could hook up like, like, if I could hook up like two jumper cables on your earlobes, you could power like all of New York City. Okay? So, but, but he's the power through you. So everyone say, I am, I am humbly powerful. Okay? And let's, since all this is true, so that makes you pretty amazing, so say, I'm amazing. And now say, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. And now, after you said you're amazing and awesome, I want you to imagine a giant exclamation point coming down from heaven and just landing on earth and just going, bam. Everyone say, bam. bam. Say, say, say I'm, I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm awesome. That's who I am. That's who I am. Bam. Bam. That's the exclamation point. Okay, let's try it again. I'm amazing. I'm, amazing. I'm, awesome. I'm awesome. That's who I am. That's who I am. Bam. Bam. One more time, a little stronger. I'm amazing. I'm, amazing. I'm, awesome. I'm awesome. That's who I am. That's who I am. Bam. <laughs>
<laughs> should watch you guys doing that. You should really flip the camera. That would have been great. Okay, now we're going to snap on four. Snap on four with that. So now we have empty future. Empty future because we're riding it. We're riding the wave of now. And that's who I am. And that's step one. That was only step one of four. Okay? Number one was the neshama of who we are. Okay? So on four, on four we're going to snap. One, two, three. Feel the difference? But that's who I am. Riding into an empty future. How awesome is that? Totally, it's a little different. You sense the difference? Because that's who I, who am I? That? No. That's in the past. That's a pretty powerful way to go in. So that was number one. Number two is the beautiful child. Each person has a unique personality. Now you know that, except where to go. Where is it? Where's your unique personality? You know, I'll, oh, there's a good crowd. Any of you guys ever worked with a cheder, like three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds? Raise your hand if you ever worked. Yeah, you did? Okay, great. How old? What? Five. five. Excellent. And how many kids was your biggest class? What? I had four-year-olds. Four-year-olds, how many kids? 32. 32 four-year-olds? <laughs> You're huge, bro. We got 50 girls watching 50 kids in this place. All we needed was you. <laughs> so, so you watch 32, 40, 40. <laughs> This guy's got broad shoulders. But here's the question. Listen up. Listen up. I want to try this before I ask you. Was anyone here ever a Rebbe of, of Kita, Kita Ches? Yes, good. Excellent. I was glad I got a big crowd. Um, how many kids? 20. Okay, 20, fine. Ready for this? Okay, and what's your name? Mordechai, I knew that. And you're? David. Okay, ready? Mordechai and David? Mordechai, were any of those two kids the same? Were, was there even overlap? Like one kid was even a little the same? There's no overlap. The, uh, he, oh, you didn't hear his answer. Sorry, he went. <laughs> Can you say no and said, were any of those two kids the same? Okay, no. now, David, you ready for this? Were any of those two kids different? Yeah. That's because you're a good machana. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Is that at that age, girls do it too, at that age, you do everything you can to be like all the other kids. In fact, if you even have one bit of uniqueness sticking out, you'll amputate it. <laughs> You're self-amputating at that age. The beautiful child is who Modche had in his classes over there before they lost it. It's your special, unique personality. Now, once again, is there any greater example than me? <laughs> Meaning, did you notice that my beautiful child's always playing? Who knows me pretty well? You know me pretty well. What do you say, Rabbi Sabel? Would you say my beautiful child's playing always? Have you ever seen me not have my beautiful child playing? My beautiful child's always playing. Always playing. By the way, he was not playing for like 30 years. I, only when I was 33 years old, I, I had to go back and get him. And believe me, I cried bitter tears, and it was not easy to retrieve my beautiful child. But then I started playing. When I was 20, I read in a book to look in a mirror. It was just an exercise in a book. It, it, to look in a mirror and say, I love you, I really love you, at yourself in the mirror. It said if you break the mirror, spit on the mirror, can't say it, or you said it, but you didn't mean it, then you have to say, I'm willing to learn to love you. It I had to say the second one, obviously. It took me five weeks, twice a day, to say, I'm willing to learn to love you, before I could get the words out to say, I love you, I really love you. I left that kid so in the dust, you have no idea. All of us did. 
That little kid was a liability to us in a world of people who were somebody. Which is crazy because every time you open up any book from Bereshis till all the way through every Sefer Makshav and Hasidus, the whole point of the book is Bittel to get you back to your beautiful child. <coughs> Hashem created your personality. It's so gorgeous. But sadly, many of us have to go back and do the work to go get it. We've got to retrieve it. It's like if you were going for Shabbos, but the town you've got to get to is up this big mountain, and you've got to get over the mountain, and you see there's not enough gas. We're like, we're not going to get over the mountain. We're not going to make it for Shabbos. So what do you do? Your wife's like, I got an idea. Keep driving. I'll start throwing heavy things out the window. The car will be lighter. You're like, there goes your straima. There goes the suitcases. There goes this. There goes that. She's not throwing the child. And we did. And now we're on the other side of the hill trying to figure out what happened to the beautiful child in us. Do you know, do you know what it's like to have employees who have their child intact? Do you know what it's like to be married to someone whose child's intact? Do you know what it's like to, be a, to have a boss whose child's intact? Do you know what pleasure that is? It's their actual personality. <laughs> it's like authentic. It's like being authentic. Like how awesome is it to be authentic? Because when you've got some like, <laughs> you know, personality you created, so no one should know something that wasn't even true. There's nothing authentic. It's like it takes a lot of energy just to get close to you. And even then, it's not even you. Stage, stage one sec. Stage one is Neshama. Stage two is the beautiful child. Stage three is your koichas and nefesh. Every person has different koichas and nefesh. Your koichas and nefesh come from the Esser Spheros. Hashem created the world with the Esser Spheros. So every person has a, has a sphere that's unique to them. And it's very easy to find your sphere, super easy. Because you're either flow or structure. Certain people are flow, certain people are structure. I'm flow. That's why when every time uh, one of the rap, uh, Avrumi Ringo keeps coming to the door to tell me what time it is, he knows me. He knows I have no idea what time it is. So every once in a while he comes to the door to tell me how many minutes. Because I'm flow. But there are structure types. So that's, that's the whole right kav, which is chachma, chesed, and netzach. And then there's the whole left kav, which is structure. Bina, gevura, and hot. You're one or the other. That's all they got. Now, the other thing is your USB cable interface to the world. You're either one, intellectual, or you're like me, two, interpersonal, or you're like, you know, the guard over there, Eyal, is uh, the Israeli security guard. You're three, which is instinctual. You're more physical. Instinctual. Intellectual, interpersonal, instinctual. Chabad, Hagas, or Nehi. That's your options. Now we have all three. So I'm a 231. Baruch Hashem, I married a 231. So we both mostly like to connect, talking. We both love to do, you know, hikes together, do yoga together. Like, we love doing things together, physical. And the last is intellectual. She's more intellectual than me. But whatever your settings are, is your, and I'm flow. So if I'm flow and I'm a two, three, one, that means I'm chesed. That's my mida. So I'm mida se chesed. And once you know it, there's certain jobs Someone who's midas achesed, there's certain jobs that you take. All those wealthy guys in, in uh, Wall Street, those guys are all hoed, meaning they're instinctual guys. They got their finger on the pulse of the markets, and they're structured. They understand numbers. They're all hoed guys. You try to talk to them about something intellectual, they're just like, who cares? It means nothing to them. And it's so funny because those guys have been funding the Balchuva movement all these years. And the rabbis, the Balchuva movement, think that their service to do for the, for the donors is to learn with them. 
<laughs> when you're learning with a Wall Street guy who's hoed, meaning he's, in, he's just an instinct guy. He's not interested in all the makshava that some rabbi wants to teach them. Now, number three is your koichas and nefesh. So again, who am I? Number one, neshama. Number two, the beautiful child. Number three, your koichas and nefesh. Now, I have videos on Torani time that you can just listen to that are, are, it's a whole questionnaire experience to figure out your koichas and nefesh so that you can get it dialed in. And again, it comes with specific jobs, specific likes and interests, and how to work it out with a spouse who might have different numbers, meaning they're another, they're another one. They're not your same sphere. And number four is to be a kli for Hashem. Is that whoever you call me into being, I am. Hashem always has us. I mean, you know, you're being asked to do things all the time, either by people or ashkocha. You're always got to, like, be doing something. We're yidin. We're not sitting on the top of a mountain meditating on now. We're busy. And so whatever task you ever go into, there's always a being you can create for that task. So whoever God calls me into being, I am. As opposed to you having to do some task that's exhausting you and you're complaining to your best friend that you're so exhausted. Oh, you must be so exhausted. But no, whatever you get called into being, whatever God calls me into being, I am. I have a resource state for everything. Oh, I got to go speak to my Minhahel. So for most people, he's, called, he's not called Minhahel for nothing. Minhahel, he's from hell. He's the guy from hell. <laughs> but I have a being that I can declare for the 15 minutes with the Minhahel of who I am as a resource state for that meeting. Oh, I got a business meeting. Whoever you call me into being, I am, and I can declare who I am into that business meeting and and do an amazing job, even if it's the opposite of my spheros, of my personality. Sorry, my kochas and nefesh. So I'm just going to review them real quick. The neshama, the beautiful child, the kochas and nefesh, and then I'm just a kli in the hand of God. And whoever he calls me into being, I am. I could be a janitor, I could be the guy who dries the dishes while my wife does them. Yeah, I can be a melech for my family. I, it's just whoever he calls me into being, he's got me. Moshe Rabbeinu was the ultimate kli. He can shepherd sheep or he could shepherd a whole nation for 40 years. Whoever you call me into being, I am. Okay, so we're going to snap on four. One, two, three. Close your eyes a moment. And whisper the words, whoever you call me into being, I am. Whisper the words, say it louder, whoever you call me into being, I am. Keep your eyes closed, snap on four, one, two, three. Whoever you call me into being, I am. Open your palms a little bit, like towards Shmayim. You know, rest them on your legs, wherever you want. And say the words, whoever you call me into being, I am. At your service. Ride the now as you do this. Last time, eyes open. One, two, three. Let's do it together on four. One, two, three. The surprise is that this is Devekas. Take a moment and realize that when people talk about Devekas, you're experiencing it right now. Stop waiting for it and start experiencing it. Stop postponing it. One, two, three. Doesn't get better than this. Doesn't get better than this. Like, what's missing in your life right now? Nothing. 
just like the beautiful child. Beautiful child doesn't get bored, just, just present. What do you think was happening? Nothing. That was the whole point. I don't know if you were here when we started. Yeah. We're catching our brain from hijacking our presence by getting it to be quiet. So we're not thinking anything. Well, you probably weren't either. Yeah, we weren't supposed to be thinking. Last time, one, two, three. I want to give everyone a bracha to live very rich and highly empowered, gorgeous lives. And don't complain. Whatever complains remains. Anything you're complaining about is going to keep going. Whatever you resist persists. The opposite, when you just be present and be real and authentic, your life's such a bracha. So may we all be blessed to live mamish, a life of bracha. A good okay. devah. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.